Sure. And welcome to part two of Meet the Friends. I'm introducing you to some historical Friends figures, as you figured out. Um, the picture of the person that you're seeing right now on the screen is not um, one of our current members, just so you know that. <laughs> but I do actually think that um, the best way to get to know friends is to get to know one. There's no substitute for getting to know a real live Quaker. I was once given the opportunity to speak in an, a literature class at Bora High School because they had read a certain book that made reference to Quakers and they didn't know what Quakers were. <laughs> and so I was asked to share, literally, what are Quakers? And this teacher was almost astonished that there really are Quakers still alive. And so the thing that was most interesting to me about that experience in sharing with these kids, and it was a great experience actually, um, was to share that the Quakers are a religious movement. That's something they didn't know. They just think of Quakers as somehow a society, which Quakers are, in that we, but, but it's not like we're um, genetically connected, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. And so it was just a, a big revelation to them to figure that out. So we've been introducing the uh, history of friends, but I would encourage you to get to know some real life friends. Now, I have put on your screen another person who is very important to Quaker history. It, my hint for this, if you don't know who this is, is that it's not the same person I had on the screen last week who was George Fox. That said, does anyone want to guess who that is by his mug? Can you figure out who that is? <laughs> What's this? It is William Penn. <laughs> Congratulations. I should give you a prize of a pen. You can take that pen on your clipboard home. It says Meridian Friends on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Someone mentioned something about uh, lost keys. I don't think that's any of you online, but we'll figure it out here. <laughs> that is William Penn. William Penn lived in 1644 until 1718. And one reason that I chose to feature William Penn, very important Quaker in our history. He's best known for the founding of Pennsylvania, the colony. Maybe you don't know, but friends were extremely influential uh, around that time of the New World. Yes, it was named after William Penn. But he also was very influential in the framing of the Constitution. Uh, he was someone who was very well respected. He actually came from wealth in England and um, ended up becoming a Quaker and very much was convinced of things that friends we're convinced of. And one of those has to do with war and peace. And that's going to be our topic here today. William Penn uh, knew George Fox and corresponded with George Fox. And William Penn is the one to whom George Fox famously said, wear the sword as long as you can. Now, in those days, it was actually fashionable for certain people of certain class to wear a sword. It was part of their outfit, if you will. And William Penn continued to wear a sword long after he became a Quaker. And he even cited to George Fox, you know, Jesus said something about if you don't have the money as you go out for the journey, sell things to buy your sword. And, and George Fox's answer, which I think was really important, is wear your sword as long as you can. And I think that's a good introduction to everything else that I want to say about friends and peacemaking. And I think that will be evident as we go along. I want to ask this question, and I think my advancer needs to be plugged into a different computer. I'm not sure, but this isn't advancing. So if you just want to advance that slide for me, and we'll figure that out as we go. I want to ask this important question. What is the historic testimony of friends? And first and foremost, this is where friends come from as a testimony from history. Um, war is incompatible with Christian holiness. That's how friends would say it. They believe that war itself and outward wars fought are incompatible with the holiness of what it means to be a Christian. So, for example, Isaiah 2, verse 4, God shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many people 
And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, as we look at this passage, often what we think is, of course, this is a description of the end of the age. We know that peace is finally going to come, right? We know that one day God will set the world straight. And I just preached this morning on how messed up the world is and how many wars we're involved with currently in this world. And so Isaiah seems really impractical, doesn't it? Well, I think this is as good an introduction to friends as any. Quakers are those people that took figuratively what other people took literally and took literally what many others took figuratively. How's that? You might think about that as you continue to think about um, the Quaker testimony. So, for example, when they heard, don't take oaths, they heard that as, don't take oaths. And so they got into a lot of trouble legally with don't take oaths because when you are in a court environment, what do you need to do? You need to take an oath. And magistrates took that as a great offense. (laughs) Many Quakers spent a lot of time in prison and in jail and the early friends. They had a great prison ministry because that's where they were. No kidding. (laughs) And they saw the incredible reforms that needed to happen within prison life as well. They believed that war was incompatible with Christian holiness. Quaker founder George Fox and many early friends were imprisoned for their convictions, including the refusal to bear arms In 1651, when George Fox was offered the opportunity to accept a military assignment in exchange for his release from prison, he responded, and this is, bear Isaiah 2-4 in mind, I told them that I lived in the virtue of that life and power which took away the occasion for all wars. So I want you to hear this as the friend's historic testimony and to consider this testimony and whether or not historic friends were right. I think that's something we really need to think about. Is war incompatible with Christian holiness? Well, George Fox believed he already lived in the occasion of the fact that, war, that learning war and violence are no longer necessary because Jesus has come. Does this make sense? I'm offering to you the way that George Fox would say that. Having said that, I want to clear up a misnomer about friends, a misunderstanding about friends. Friends do not train people to be conscientious objectors. I think, for the most part, people would tell you that's what friends do, and I'm here to tell you friends do not train people to be conscientious objectors. Let me explain what friends do train people to be. Friends train people to be followers of Christ, and we seek to train people to respond in obedience to God's will. The Friends Church named themselves the Friends Church after John 15, 14. You're my friends, if you do what I command. From the outside, as an external label, they were called Quakers. And in fact, some, there's some legends around where the term Quaker came from, but one of them has to do with a justice saying to a Quaker who was on trial, who refused to, I don't know, use an oath or take off his hat in court or something like that, that you really ought to tremble before me, you tremble before God, you're a Quaker. Now, that, that's, there's some legends associated with, I don't know that anybody knows for sure where the term Quaker came from, but that one sounds good to me. But the Quaker movement, the Friends, called themselves Friends. So that's an internal designation, and they referred to themselves as Friends. They first called themselves Uh, Children of the Light and Followers of the Way. I mentioned William Penn earlier. William Penn wrote a book called No Cross, No Crown. And in the book, he makes a case for the Society of Friends as primitive Christianity revived. And that's what friends wanted to do. They just wanted to take seriously what they saw in Scripture. They wanted to revive the church. They wanted to revive what they believed Jesus said. They wanted to take him very seriously even though in so many ways it made them incredibly unpopular, and especially with regard to their peace stand and what they believed about war. But here again, Quakers were not people that were, went out of their way to train people to be conscientious objectors. They simply invited you to listen to the voice of Christ yourself, to take seriously the scriptures that pointed to a peace testimony. And that's where friends come from. That's what they land on. That's what they want to do. They want to revive primitive Christianity. You may not know this. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Friends do not consider their peace testimony as a Quaker testimony, but as a Christian testimony. All that they wanted to do was revive primitive Christianity. They really didn't care about starting a new movement. They just wanted to bring people into a relationship with Christ, one of obedience and one of following him. They don't consider their testimony as Quaker. Did you know that for the first 300 years of Christianity, all followers of Christ refused to bear arms? That's something that a lot of people don't know. St. Augustine came along and developed what he called holy war. It was a concept that was new to the church. And it had to do with whether or not it was okay for a Christian or even a Christian's duty to go to war when its nation told them to fight. But that was something that Christians had been persecuted for for 300 years prior to his time. Friends knew that. And they had a certain way of looking at Scripture. So I think if friends only want to point us to what the voice of Jesus says, if they don't really care about being misunderstood, and they're not out to force you into a certain mold, I think we have to ask this, wouldn't you agree? What does the Bible say about all this? Friends witness, friends historic testimony, that black and white picture I showed you of William Penn, (laughs) these lives that came before us, what does that point to in the scripture? And can we look at it afresh with different eyes? What does the Bible say about this? I want to look at three different places in the Bible to get an answer. I want us to consider the Old Testament. I want us to consider Jesus' teaching on peace. And then the epistles' teaching on peace. Do you agree that seems like a good place to start? We're all wanting to follow Jesus. We're all wanting to do whatever he said. So let's look at the scriptural evidence. I might start right here where you thought I would. Exodus 20, verse 13. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. That word kill is not the same as murder. Okay? It's not the same. Sorry. That word kill is different than the word murder. The word kill is ratzak in Hebrew. And that's really important because ratzak means unauthorized killing. It's a certain kind of killing. It's unauthorized killing which implies in the Old Testament mind that there is such a thing as authorized killing. The basic principle of this goes like this. The taking of life is for God to decide. So in other words, it's God's authority and it's God's decision to give life and to take life. Can we all agree that that's where that commandment's coming from? It's all about God's prerogative to to give life and to take life. And of course, what we're going to say is, well, in the Old Testament, didn't God command people to go to war? Yes. My point about the word ratzak and do not kill would be this. In commanding his people to go to war, God did not delegate the authority to kill. Let me explain this. When God says for the nation of Israel that they need to wipe out all these Amalekites and Hittites and Hivitites and all kinds of ites in the Old Testament, that's God's prerogative to do. Would you agree? It's just something to think about. Boy, I read the Old Testament, and I've shared this before from the pulpit. Oh, it makes me so uncomfortable. It's difficult to read. For whatever reason, God saw it as necessary to eliminate entire populations. It's something I don't understand. It's something as a person of faith I do look at and say, but that's God's problem, not mine to justify. Are you with me? That's God's business, to give life and to take life. He's the only one that can take it because he's the only one that can give it. He has the authority to do that. So when God said, no Ratzak, he was not condemning the people that he told to kill for their killing. Because their killing was authorized killing. It was a certain kind of killing. Does that make sense? So the critical thing for us when it comes to war is going to be this. Is it God authorized? And this is where St. Augustine came in as the first voice in the church to say it can be. There is a concept out there in the church that's been around now for 1,700 years 
that says that there is such a thing as holy war. There are wars that God authorizes for God's purpose. Now, it didn't take very long for the church to get in big trouble with this one. Am I right? Of course, you're going to leave it to a Quaker to bring up the Crusades. Be converted or be killed, which is exactly the persecution that the first century Christians underwent as well. Did it work? No. Here again, I think what we always have to evaluate then, we're teaching people to be discerning, right? We're teaching people to listen to the voice of Christ and take Scripture for what it says. What we're inviting people to do is to ask, is God behind that action? You have to do it. Are you with me? As a Christian, as as a follower of Christ, our first allegiance is always going to be the voice of Jesus. No questions asked. And is God delegating that authority to the government? Or isn't God delegating that authority to the government? And is God delegating that authority to the government in every circumstance and in every war that they want to be engaged in? Or are some wars more justified than others? And what I want to tell you is that not all Quakers agree about that. And what I'm trying to tell you is, that's okay. We're inviting you to listen to the voice of Jesus on that. World War II, for example, is referenced as the good war, right? There are many other wars and conflicts that we've been engaged with that history will probably look back on and not see it the same way. So tragically, many veterans who've come back from those wars have not been as venerated as those veterans that came back from World War II. Pretty complicated, right? Did you hope to come here and get all the answers? I don't have them. But we do have a family history together of wanting to look at this bigger question. What does God authorize and what doesn't God authorize? And I can even go back to the Old Testament and show you that with the most basic scripture that says, thou shalt not kill. Are you with me? Let's think about that in terms of authorized killing or unauthorized killing. I think that's the right way to think about it. Now, as a special note, we might pay attention to 1 Chronicles 22. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me, You've shed so much blood and have fought so many wars. You're not to build a house for my name, because you've shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest. And I look at that with great mystery. And and I'm just being honest about that. It seems that the wars David fought in were God-authorized. And yet there's something about them that prevents him from being able to build the temple. Have you ever noticed that? And then comes along Solomon. I think of Solomon as kind of this free spirit guy who's intellectual and and he's not practical. He's not blue collar. He's handed everything. He he studies and, and he goes off in all kinds of pursuits of pleasure and everything else. And God says he's the one that gets to build the temple. Well, go figure. You and I will have to take this up with God at some other time. Are you with me? But that passage is in there. And I think there's something interesting about that because it's in there even in the Old Testament. What does violence do to us as people? How does God look at the issue of violence itself? Now, the real thesis for Quakers and where they've always pointed really isn't the Old Testament. But I wanted to share that with you because I'm not trying to dodge it. I'm not trying to say, well, of course, uh, Old Testament is Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, I wanted to give that harder explanation first. Where Quakers go, of course, is Jesus teaching on peace. Am I right? And I honestly think that this is the harder part for the modern church to look at with fresh eyes. Could we? What did Jesus say about it? Well, Matthew chapter 5 captures what you might think of as the summary of Jesus' teaching. Would you agree? The Sermon on the Mount is the summary of Jesus' teaching. And would you agree that the Beatitudes are the summary of the summary? So Jesus starts with these Beatitudes, these descriptions of what this life that is available to us presently in the midst of conflict looks like when Jesus is in control. 
Blessed are, blessed are. And Jesus takes all of our expectations and he dumps them upside down, right? He says things like, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecuted. So Jesus is is offering a narrow way. He's offering a way that the world is not going to like. A world that is, look, our human nature, we're self-protective. What do we do with Jesus? What do we do with his words? And what does it mean to follow a Messiah, a Savior, who came into this world to lose everything on purpose? What does that look like for us? And what bearing does that have in, quote, the real world? If you struggle with that, I struggle with that as well. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Jesus said, turn the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. That's an interesting phrase, by the way. If they want your outer coat, a Roman soldier um, had the authority to take it from you just by asking for it. But as a witness against the, sol- against the soldier, Jesus says, give him your tunic as well, which leaves you uncovered. And your nakedness in front of a Roman soldier is an embarrassment to that soldier. It's a seizing of the power. It's a turning of the tables of power. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Be children of your Father in heaven. If, if that soldier makes you go one mile, go too and show him what he is doing to you. Turning the tide, offering a witness of self-surrender, of meekness, and of peace as a way of changing that soldier's perspective. What's our way of doing it? I'm not turning the other cheek. I'm going to give you a knuckle sandwich because you've got it coming. And that's the natural thing to do. What do we do with this Jesus who gives us these words in Scripture? Like I said, friends are ones who took literally what others took figuratively, right? What do the epistles have to say about everything Jesus said? And there are so many other places to look. God's people must not be quarrelsome. They must be gentle, patient teachers of those who are wrong. I had a, a Quaker professor that invited our class one time to imagine Jesus dressed in battle armor, carrying a weapon. Can you do it? Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble Even though you live in this world, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but repay evil with blessing. Is this practical? For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. There are so many things in Scripture that make us uncomfortable, right? Does that give us the right to dismiss them? What is the voice of God with regard to violence in the world? What is he calling us to be? What is he calling us to do as a church? I think this is really important stuff. Now, I told you last week that I came to become a Christian through the Friends Church. I didn't grow up going to Sunday school or church. I don't know any better than what the friends have said. But I've certainly done diligence, to my satisfaction anyway, in terms of studying what Jesus said, not what Quaker said. And so I'm offering you what the scripture says about this. And it's really difficult. Is peacemaking practical in the real world? Isn't this the right question? Isn't this the question we all want to address? Is peacemaking practical in the real world? Some Quakers who are in line with the historic friends' testimonies refuse to bear arms, believing that their refusal has the potential as a witness to influence the world by nonviolent example, therefore leading society into a better place. For them, they're saying, well, whether it's practical or not, it's what Jesus said to do. And 
how is anyone going to be the first to put down their arms if not us? Because really, as Christians, we're not home yet, and we know that. And we're going to bear witness to that. Right? Some friends would see it that way, and in fact, they would see it as practical because they're serving as a sacrificial witness to others. They believe that that would lead to greater justice and stability. Now, other Quakers choose to bear arms. Have I said that clearly enough? Other Quakers choose to bear arms and they are certainly not rejected as Quaker because being a Quaker doesn't mean following historic Quaker testimonies. Being a Quaker means following the voice of Jesus Christ. Agreed? And many Quakers who are very mature in their faith, whom we love and respect greatly, choose to bear arms Sometimes they do that out of a sense that really, practically speaking, a strong defense, in fact, it's so strong you want to say it twice in your slide. (laughs) A strong defense is the best deterrent to violence or war. Can you see where that would be true? A strong defense is, in fact, the best deterrent to war. Some believe that. I want to note this. This is a hard note. A pacifist risks being viewed as ungrateful or non-patriotic. There's a movie that came out just a few years ago. It's called Unbroken. And it's the story of someone who, for religious conviction, refused to bear arms. It's a powerful, powerful story. And... This person happened to be Seventh-day Adventist, not Quaker. But for the same scriptures and the same reasons that Quakers cite as to why they feel war is incompatible with Christian holiness and they simply refuse. It's a powerful movie. It shows you one of the good things that has happened with our military in allowing something called conscientious objection. Allowing a person to serve without bearing arms. Something to think about. Has the status of conscientious objector been abused? I think so. I'm pretty sure. By those who may be ungrateful, by those who may be non-patriotic, I imagine so. But there are many others for whom uh, this has been a genuine way to literally risk their lives in service to their country. I think a Quaker would say something like this. A Quaker would respond that while they are willing to die for their country, they are not willing to kill for it. And I say this, hopefully with a a deep measure of respect, that I was never drafted. And I didn't live in the same eras as some of you have. I don't have the same background as some of you have. I've listened to people who entered military service as conscientious objectors. I've heard some of their stories. I've heard the stories of others who have borne arms and even those who have fought in combat. My hope is that with all of us, is that we would be willing to lay down our lives for others. After all, isn't this what Jesus did? Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for others. I think that's very Christ-like. And somehow, I think the Quaker witness appeals and, and invites us to consider the difference between that heroism of laying down your life and killing. And friends don't see those as, as the same thing. Jesus, of course, was willing to lay down his life. And the witness that I see of Jesus is that he was not willing to kill. Scripture tells us Jesus could have brought 10,000 angels to his side when he was there on the cross. Don't think those angels would have been the singing variety 
they would have been the army to do violence, to protect him. This wasn't the way of Jesus. And I think this is very convicting for us as we try to live out very practically what is our faith in this incredibly difficult and complicated world. The last thing that I want to say with regard to practicality is this. Biblical peacemaking is not a sideline issue. It's what I call a goal line issue. In other words, peacemaking is not uh, peacemaking is active, not passive. I identified in my sermon this morning that real peace is not so much the end of something, but the beginning of something until the end. And I believe that God's kingdom has been established on earth. It's alive within the hearts of others. And it's meant like a small unseen thing like yeast to work its way through the whole dough to change it. I'm going to end. Uh, oh, and let me, let me just say, as a goal line issue, it's something that we are to pursue. It's something that we are to do. Quakers were offered the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947 for their peacemaking efforts because they have been known for generations as people who initiate treaties, people who initiate understanding, people who initiate dialogue as an alternative to conflict. Tough subject. Thanks for hanging in there with me. We're going to tune you out online, but online we do invite you to write down your questions and your thoughts. I'm willing to take them, I promise. Uh, So thanks for joining us online.